Hey, ambitious dentist, welcome to Start Your Dental Practice, the show for existing and aspiring dentists to take your dental practice to the highest possible level. I'm your host, Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV, founder of DentistMetrics.com. In every episode, we aim to demystify the how to start a dental practice problem by bringing on world-class dentists, influencers, and consultants in the dental industry to pick their brain about how to get past the barriers involved from going from no practice to being a practice owner to owning your own successful dental practice. Building wealth will prove to be extremely difficult, even impossible, if you are financially illiterate. Now, on today's show, we welcome back a very special guest, Dr. Tom Larkin. I have titled Dr. Larkin as a true renaissance man in dentistry, and he joins us this time to share some instrumental information that can help shape your financial future. So Dr. Larkin is the clinical director of Ideal Practices. He's also the founder of oralwellnesscenter.org, which is doing some really incredible fascinating and fascinating things as far as linking oral systemic health with dentistry. He's also an instructor at Louisville School of Dentistry. So first, here are a few things you're gonna hear about today. You're gonna to learn about the surprising history of marketing and dentistry, four rock solid financial literacy tips, now follow these to set yourself up for long-term success, a little known fact about mutual funds, now if you overlook this truth, you'll be gonna be leaving a lot of money on your table, a stock market rule to follow that could potentially multiply your money, what you need to know about human nature and greed that is a key part to financial literacy, how to increase your income simply by changing your mindset and habits, a few subjects you should educate yourself on to increase your financial literacy, a recommendation on how to work together with your significant other to build a solid financial foundation. So at the end of this episode, you'll find out where you can get a bonus that lays out the four key principles that will shape your financial future. So be sure to listen all the way through this entire interview to get access to that. Now, here's my interview with Dr. Tom Larkin. And as a quick disclaimer, I am not a financial planner. I am not. I don't have any type of financial accreditations other than my CPA, which has nothing to do with financial planning. So this is not professional advice. This is just two guys talking about things that dentists need to know before they get out of dental school. Hello, ambitious dentist. Today I have with us yet again Dr. Tom Larkin, a good friend. Uh, we had Dr. Larkin on just a couple episodes ago. Uh, if you, I highly urge you to go back and listen to that episode. Talked a lot about Dr. Larkin's history, what he sees in the industry right now, where he sees things going. And today, uh, he's been gracious enough to be able to come back on and talk to us more about financial literacy. Dr. Larkin has a lot of experience with young dentists uh, from his time as being an instructor and actually seeing people go from student to full-time dentist. Uh, and so he kind of sees some of the struggles that occur in that. And one of the things that he said was a big struggle for students right now is for financial literacy just the basics of financial literacy in today's economy because today is a lot different than five years ago it's a lot different than 20 years ago it's a lot different than 50 years ago and every year it's going to get it's going to change uh, so some of the things that you're going to need to know about today we're going to have to go back a little bit into the past to be able to figure out how we got to today so dr larkin's going to actually kind of set up a framework of a little bit of the history of the dental industry uh, and where we are today. So Dr. Larkin, thanks for coming on again and we can get started. Awesome to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Sure, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about as far as what your, um, tell us a little bit about what you think about the history of, of the dental profession and, and how okay. we kind of got to today. You know, the first thing I want to touch on is is a couple of the uh, young dentists that we met in Vegas at the, uh, at the Startup Practice Blueprint and they were um, representatives of Ignite DDS and Dr. David's right, uh, Rice's initiative. And I was so impressed with them because they were so on, so on fire in acquiring knowledge. And, and what is so cool that young dentists need to understand today is their ability to, to acquire really, really rock solid information. And because I tell students that they are 100% responsible for their financial literacy because I've been around schools, I've taught practice management. If you think you're gonna get this in school, you're mistaken. And I think I think Dr. Rice understands that and I and I think people are beginning to to understand that. So what I want to do is is kind of is give a little bit of a history lesson because I want to make sure that all young dentists know some really basic premises. And one of them is 
did you know that marketing was illegal at one time? Like within my, within my career, when I started, marketing was illegal and that the local dental society dictated the size of the letters that were on the door, you know, with your name. And so what I want to walk through a brief history lesson because this really frames the culture that's in dental education and, and why is it that these pieces are missing, okay? So I'm gonna go back to 1975 and there was a, uh, a major lawsuit between the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, and the American Medical Association and it had to do with physicians advertising. And this worked its way through the courts and in the early 80s it got to the Supreme Court and the FTC won and that said that the American Medical Association could not uh, restrict advertising for its members. So in 82, the FTC uh, prohibited the ADA, the American Dental Association, from restricting advertising to its members. So that's important to know that, you know, these are big watershed moments in the history of, of, of dentistry because what I see happening over a long period of time, culturally, is that we were taught that we were doctors, but we're conflicted if we're businessmen. And I'm gonna show you several, several moments in time, okay? So last week I got a, uh, an anniversary edition of The Profitable Dentist, and you probably maybe have heard of Woody Oaks, but it was his 25 year anniversary. And there was an awesome timeline of the history of his publication. And I wrote down a couple of things out of that. So in 1991, the American Dental Association chastised Dr. Woody Oaks for using the words profitable dentist, okay, because that was the name of his newsletter. And, and they said that he was soiling the good name of dentistry and that they threatened to take appropriate action. Okay, you gotta, I'm, I'm trying to imagine being him, he's trying to help people, and, and he's being told by or, the, the largest organization representing dentists that he's soiling the good name by using the word profit. I think this is really, really key to know culturally how, how what has happened, why it's happened, okay? Mm -hmm. So in, um, in 1995, I'm teaching part-time in the dental school, and I'm approached by the class president because I knew that I had really substantial private practice experience. And would I lecture to them on practice management? And that's when I started a lunch and learn series that was once a week, nearly every student in the class attended. And that's when I began to write my first book. And one of the quotes out of my book that I remember distinctly was that I said that marketing was going to be an essential skill for the dentist going forward. This is 1995, okay? Here's the end result of that course. The end result was at the end of the year, I was voted uh, teacher of the year. I was the first part-time instructor to ever receive that award. And I was recognized by the entire class in my effort to improve financial literacy, practice management literacy. Sure. Now, what was the reaction to the school administration? From that point forward, the school administration banned me from having my lunch and learns and I couldn't meet with students outside of class. They also changed the regulations that said part-time faculty is no longer eligible for awards. Okay, <laughs> that was the reaction to the culture. Okay, sure. And so, you know, these kind of things are really, really difficult to grasp. Okay, so here's another thing on Woody's timeline: 1999, Woody Oaks, Howard Ferran, Gordon Christensen, and Rich Maydow meet with the American Dental Association board to discuss the stance on marketing. And, and their voice that the ADA was out of touch. And this is just a quote right from the newsletter. As Woody recalled, the meeting ended abruptly and the promise for a follow-up never occurred. That's in 1999, that is not that long ago, okay? No. So the topic of marketing, okay, this was what they, they, what they, and these are, you know, this is Gordon Christensen, this is Howard Ferran, okay? These are people of, of giant influence in our industry. So here's the message, and I want you to know that the message of organized dentistry is also the message of the culture in our school. So the message is, business is bad, money's bad, profit is bad, success is bad, let's just work on being doctors, okay? This whole conflict of, of business, okay? So I think over time, um, methodically, this head in the sand as to what our identity has, has set us up for what has happened, okay? Financial illiteracy, this is my quote of the day, is the root of corporate dentistry. Financial illiteracy is the root. So everybody's throwing up their hands, oh my gosh, here's corporate this, corporate that, we've lost our profession. 
well, how and why did we lose it? Look at what's happened the last 20 years. We don't know who we are. Are, are we doctors or are we business people? Okay, so, so in 2012, this was the kicker for me. The head of Henry Schein's transition came in to do an all-day seminar for the senior class. And this is right off of one of his slides. It said, upon graduation, you will have 20% of what you need to know to make a living in dentistry. Okay, now I'm sure that was just his random opinion, but if, if he was even remotely close, that's unacceptable. That's 2012, saying mm -hmm. you, you aren't even remotely prepared. Now, in a way, he is smiling because there is an entire industry outside of dental schools that are very, very happy to give you the other 80% that you don't have. But what I saw from those, those young students who were involved with ASDA and with Ignite DDS is that this isn't acceptable anymore, okay? This is not acceptable for young dentists to be undereducated upon graduation. And I see a real grassroots effort with social media and, um, and with ADA success, you know, some of the younger initiatives, this isn't acceptable anymore. And so I'm very, very relieved and I'm going to do whatever I can. Um, uh, David Rice, there's a section on um, on complete health that I want to assist with Ignite. And, and what Jamie Amos is doing with ideal practices, you know, trying to elevate this, this whole field. So one comment on the medical side. So the MBA suits in the hospital, in the insurance industry, um, they basically took over the profession of medicine almost effortlessly because the physicians were too confused as to whether or not they were doctors or businessmen. And now, as a result, they're employees, okay? So the assumptions from these very, very smart people who, who now, the executives in the healthcare industry, are, are making millions of dollars, but they, to them, an MD degree, and I've heard someone use this term, meant money dumb. Okay, that's what an MD meant, your money dumb. So, so we've had this whole area of, of illiteracy um, on basic finance, basic practice management, and heaven forbid, you know, a topic like marketing. So, so now dentistry, we're faced with the exact same threat. But the good news is, and I, and I think you see it, I mean, I, you're a huge part of this. You're changing the paradigm with how you're presenting uh, finance so that it's understandable for the, to the dentist so that he's engaged in the process. And that's why I like this, uh, this entire ideal practices, all the people that I've met, we all have a common goal and it's about, it's about the entrepreneur and it's about preserving independence, you know, because I think, I think on the medical side, I think most of the physicians have pretty much, have pretty much given up, sold their practices and, and come and except for this very, very, there's a very small group and one that, that I've assisted lately that are getting into um, concierge, and, and direct uh, direct reimbursement medicine. Once again, a very disruptive technology that's kind of a backlash of the general public saying, you know, I hate our, our medical system the way it is now, waiting and all this other crap. And people saying, you know what, I would rather go pay privately for, you know, private pay. And so with the exception of that, the, the, medical, the medical field is, is pretty much in, in, in peril. I don't see that in dentistry. I mean, I really see um, some people circling the wagons. Even in the conversation with um, with DSOs, there there are dentists who are trying to form groups of of dentists, not corporate owned, but dentally owned, have some economy of scale, have some negotiation with PPOs, buy their supplies at a discount. But this whole idea of being independent, you know, I, I think there's some there's some pushback. But the thing that really makes me the happiest is I see these young people getting this information from you and from all the podcast world and saying, I have to empower myself, forget about the dental schools, because I think the dental schools, for whatever reason, I mean, I've made my attempt, I, I've donated a ton of my time within the system, uh, and, and it's not going to happen there. And I think the young people know that now. Sure. And, you know, that's, you know, as far as, as the story you just described, it, you know, it's pretty astounding to me that the the ADA can have this type of mentality that you know the business is bad because what they have done is by creating that mindset, you know they've dissuaded people to, for, from focusing on that, and by dissuading people from focusing on that, it's it really kind of lets the lions creep in. Exactly, uh, that's the whole story. 
Right. I mean, it, because if, you know, by them putting their heads in the sand, it's just allowing the people that, you know, are the, the people that aren't afraid, the people that are the trendsetters, the people that, uh, that see the opportunity to just go for it. And if there are no, any, you know, legal or ethical restrictions against such, then right. they're perfectly within their rights to do it. And, you know, I, I don't really, I, I've never really been able to figure out the difference and why the dental community has been, has been insulated from what happened to the medical practitioners right. out, outside of the fact that it is still such a personal decision to have someone's hands in your mouth. That's it. Um, That's it. So, you know, as we go forward, uh, there, you know, I, I've seen some trends on from as far as the, the, the way the numbers go. And it was something like practices that had more than 20 employees, the revenue from that from from that segment. So the, 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 the numbers that I looked at were um, revenue, total revenue from the dental industry, p patients paying dental practices money. Uh, and it was broken down into um, uh, uh, basically a, 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 a circle graph, a pie chart, to so say like if it, it was a if it was a company that had you know more than I think it was like more than 500 employees, more than two, 20 employees, more than 10 employees, less than 10 employees, and the way the trend went was that the the companies that had more than 500 employees, their revenue doubled in 10 years. Um, the ones that had more than 20 employees, their revenue like doubled as well. The revenue from the uh, more than 10, less than 20, it went up about 50%. And the ones from, you know, under 10, it went up something like, like 5%. So everything, the, the revenue went up, but the people gaining the most of that revenue were the bigger companies right? by and far, because while it was, you know, it was it was a it was a, it was a higher percentage gain. It was also a higher number just in terms of volume of revenue. At the right. same time, more prac there was it showed the number of companies that were in those segments, and those numbers increased as well. So, it, it's one of those things that the you know as we go forward and as as a, as of total market share, if I remember correctly, the the, the bigger practices gained something like eight percent of the market share over that ten year period. Uh, so they took it away from the smaller practices at that point. Right. So, you know, if you do that over, you know, if that, that trend continues for 50 years, they're going to gain an additional 40% of the total market. And there's going to be very, very little left after that point. So if we don't do something to combat that. Right. Is incredibly easy to do in the dental industry. And actually, I personally think that the way that the industry is shaping up it's going to be necessary for most of our practitioners going forward rather than, um, th than anything else. Because, you know, we've talked about how the, you know, the, they've said profit is bad, profit is bad. The schools don't have anything to be able, or it's not that the schools don't have the c capabilities of giving this information. It's just not a part of being a medical practitioner. Right. So that's not their focus. Right. But the schools, regardless of that, they say profit is bad, profit is bad, profit is bad. They're charging so much money to get you out of school now. Yeah. You don't have yeah. any other choice but try to make money. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, I, and I think th they're probably going to do too little too late. Okay. Uh, university yesterday raised the tuition 5%. I, that is one of the most amazing things. I know um, I've, I've watched some podcasts of Mark Cuban talking about that whole thing. I've watched tuition go up 5% a year. And, and believe me, you know, um, people's standard of living in the past 10 years have not gone up at all. Mm -hmm. How do you rationalize tuition increases every year above the cost of living? It's insane. That is going to hit the wall. Mark Cuban has said that. That is the next bubble. Mm -hmm. and, and how they deal with that, I have no idea. And what that's going to look like, I have no idea. But I think, I think you hit the nail directly on the head. Because, you know, the concept of a roll-up. Roll-ups have happened in many, many industries. And what we, what we mean by roll-ups is consolidation where people are bought out and, and, and put into conglomerate corporations. But the difference in dentistry, as opposed to Walgreens and CBS, where all of the pharmacists were rolled up, is that, is that dentistry is very much a personal service, okay? And, and I, I use the word intimate, meaning outside of an OBGYN, 
it's people putting your hands in your mouth is an intimate service and it's not you know it, it shouldn't be taken lightly okay and, and it's something that when people are comfortable with you um, they stick with you on that you know for that reason alone so dentistry has some unique features to it that that we need to focus on and promote and and and, it, and it's not as conducive okay but think about this for a minute I'm thinking of these private equity guys when they were first introduced to the concept of buying dental practices and investing them. And let's say you're a, an MBA, private equity, and you know nothing about dentistry. And someone comes to you and says, listen, here's an entire industry where they've been taught in school, profit is bad, they know nothing about marketing, and they're still making great money, okay? Mm -hmm. Just think of what would happen if we went in there with systems, marketing, economy of scale, just think of what we can do. That's exactly what's happening. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars are pouring into the dental field because the dentists don't run their business like a business. If, if 20 or 30 years ago, there was an initiative to, to really make us financially literate, dentists would have a barrier. They would have a moat around their profession because they would be financially successful and, and no one could come in and take, take over and make 20 and 30 percent money on taking them over. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the cold hard facts. And if you think about you guys, if you think about it like this from, if you've ever read anything about investing, you know, a lot of people, you know, back in the, in the nineties, I can remember sitting with my, with, with my grandmother when she was going over her investments and she was saying, you know, you should be getting somewhere between five and 10% on your money every year. And you keep investing and you, that's how you build a nest egg. She's, you know, she was very financially uh, astute um was was very heavy into investing and she uh was, was very very um risk averse but she knew about you know risk tolerances and all these other things which basically right. says that you invest in more risky aspects the the younger you are because you have more earning capabilities and the older you get you start being less uh ri less risky with your investments because you're trying to get a, a more steady return right nowadays you're looking at, I mean, this was, that was like the norm. Like I, I watched the thing just a couple of days ago about um, um, investing and they were saying like in the nineties, no one could lose money in the market because it was just upward trends the whole way through. Um, everyone was making money uh, until it crashed, you know, in the two, in 2001 and then as well as 2008. Uh, and then there's a couple of mini ones in there as well. But what I'm trying to say is that you think about five to 10% return, that was what somebody was shooting for in the 90s when no one could lose money right that was over over time right. nowadays you're looking at you know five to seven percent is what most people would be ecstatic to be able to get over the lifetime of their investing correct you think about a dental practice and you say okay this practice if you think about a well-ran gp practice you can be thinking about 55 percent overhead that's before paying yourself interest you know non-cash items etc 55 percent so that means you get 45% of income based off the revenue that's coming in. When right. you think about buying a dental practice, it's usually purchased off of something like 60% of revenue. Right. To 90% to, to of revenue. So even if it was 100% of revenue, that means if somebody comes in and puts down 100% cash in what, they, in, in what they're buying, they're going to get a 45% return yeah. on that after before they pay the doctor yeah. so if they can if they can pay the doctor within that you know 20 percent, they're going to get a 25 percent return Huge. and it's very the 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 failure rate is you know one percent yeah so they yeah. have if you if you think about if they have if they could do that a hundred times yeah, they would they would lose one they would lose one out of a hundred and they'd yeah. be getting 20 basically 24 percent on their money which would be an an astounding return for these people. The bigger right. the company gets, the more money that you have, the harder it is for you to get returns on your money. It's just a, it's a rule of thumb because you can't put in a billion dollars into just a, an equity a, a market fund because it's going to cause, it's going to cause disruption in the market and right. it's incredibly complex. Uh, but these equity companies, they could put a billion dollars into a bunch of small businesses and, effectively diversify but still get that return it's a, it's a it's a huge windfall for them to be able to do that even at something like four or five percent return so they can lose they can lose a ton of money and still make acceptable returns off of that cash investment yeah 
No, I think I, that's a beautiful explanation. So I, so I think you've closed the loop historically as, as the saying, you know, these people are looking at our industry and saying, wow, there is some serious money to be made by these people who don't run their practices like a business or mm -hmm. don't, don't have financial literacy. That's the topic of today, you know, however you want to describe that. So that, that is the root cause that in my opinion, that's a 20 or 30 year perspective of why. It's because we, we've just, are we doctors? Are we businessmen? Okay. And now the physicians are employees and a, a growing percentage of dentists are becoming employees. And, and I, I find that heartbreaking because, um, you know, when I take a poll, if you, if you were in my class and you'd say, how many of you want to be your own boss? And it'd be a hundred percent. And if you did it freshman year um, today, you would probably still get the majority of the people because they have a role model, a mentor, could be a, their parent, could be a neighbor who's a dentist, and they see that dentist having a great lifestyle, and they're saying, mm -hmm. I want to go to dental school. And then you and then you survey them, you know, senior year, and how many of you are going to go into practice? And it might be one, okay? Something changed in those four years. And, and I think schools in, over time, um, you know, through social media or whatever, if, if everybody is going $300,000 in debt and buying a job, that doesn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't do that. I'm not going $300,000 in debt to buy my job. Okay. I'm doing that to become an entrepreneur and become financially independent. And when that story, um, if that story resounds very strongly, then these schools who are raising tuition 5% a year are going to have a really significant problem. Okay. That will happen. That, that, that's, that's as sure as anything. So, yeah. So the way I, the way I, I think of that as far as like saying okay three hundred thousand dollars student loans when you get out and you're let's say you're living in not New York California you're doing a, you're going to make somewhere around one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year starting out working you know working somewhere as, as as an associate the way I see that if you have three hundred thousand dollars in student loans and you're doing a twenty year payback and I know a lot of people stretch out to thirty years which is insane to me um, if you're doing a twenty year payback I looked at the numbers. It's about two grand a month you're going to be paying in in student loans. So you've got you're getting ten thousand a month, one hundred and twenty divided by twelve, and you're paying two for your student loans. So all of a sudden you're down to you're down to eight thousand dollars a month. Right. We also have to pay taxes on the income you earn that you had to pay back to the school or back, back right. to your loan. Right. So and you get no no tax benefit from that because you're too you make that's crazy. Yeah. So you got another 20% off of what you've already paid in. So you paid in 2000, 20% of that, you're going to have to pay taxes on that income. Uh, it's going to be about another 400 bucks a month. So all of a sudden you're making 10,000 a month. Now you're down to 7,600 a month. You add in the fact that you bought, you know, say a, a, a $250,000 house. Um, you all of a sudden you're, you're at 7,600. Now you've got $1,500 in, in, in mortgage payments. And you're down to sixty-one hundred dollars in, in income that you can spend on cars, food, other living expenses, um, and trying to keep up with the Joneses at that point. Because right. you have this mindset, like you said, of all of these people that um, the dentists make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, that that's that it's a you know it's a good lifestyle, and it is. It's a fantastic lifestyle if you can get it to be the right way. Right. But your your actual spending money. The sixty-one hundred dollars a month. If you have a family, you know that comes down to about two hundred dollars a day that you can spend, and that is that goes that can go by very very quickly whenever you have kids or when you if you have a spouse. Um, now maybe your spouse works, maybe they don't. Um, I know a lot of dentists that their spouses do not work, um, right. and that's just a part of it. I mean, it, it's it that that starting income it shrinks up real fast. Right. And your student loans take up a big chunk of that. If you want to try and pay those down early, there's really no way to do it in that associate model unless you get one of those unicorn positions where um, you're getting paid something like you know forty percent of production and there's just a ton of dentistry to be done. Uh, and those those are those are true unicorn diamond in the rough positions that you're not just going in every day and drilling and filling trying to get you know the next person in from in, in your dentistry mill that you're a part of. Right. Um, so that is, that is, you know, again, a lot of the reason for, for the, for the podcast is to be able to help talk to people about, you know, different ways to be able to get to dispel the fact that they can't do this whole entrepreneur thing. Right. Uh, because it's a really good time in the business world. The, the, the history of business 
it's a great time to be in business for yourself. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's more convenient. A, a lot of the processes are a lot more convenient and, and a lot and they're figured out at this point. And there's also a lot of technology that can help you with things. And there's a lot of knowledge and information that's out there to help you on the areas that you may not be able to, to know about. But it takes so long to figure out what you need to know because there's yeah. so many things that you don't know what you don't know in this in, in any business that it, it can be pretty scary. Right. Well, and, and I think you remember from the course, you know, my first practice loan was 21%. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just did a podcast uh, uh, for ideal practices yesterday and I made comment on a couple of things. I had one of the first offices that was computerized. My first computer, which would be the equivalent of a PC today that would be two or 300 bucks was $18,000. Okay. Yeah. That's what that thing cost. Okay. I showed my letterhead from back there. I had a really, really nice silver foil letterhead. I paid forty five hundred dollars for the graphic design. I get that done for a hundred dollars now online. You know, so what I'm saying is, I see lots and lots of economies that that are you know really really cost savings. You know, it, 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 there's there's kind of some offsets, okay. And so it's not that everything is is out of reach today. Um, you know, one of the thing in my notes, it's it's funny because it's almost like you saw my notes. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, and I'm just going to kind of reiterate what you were talking about. Is, is personal financial literacy and I'm gonna and I'm gonna put some comments I'm gonna kind of compliment what you were saying I was using 10,000 exactly like you did that was <laughs> in my mind. okay I have four points here and these are really really difficult points but I, I know I was taught this I was very lucky to be taught this this is not something that's very popular but the first point is to live below your means, and this, and, and this is brutal, but I'm just saying is you have no choice than to do this, okay? And and what I'm saying is everyone has their own personal economy, and that's what you just described. And I use the, I use the 10,000 as an example too. And if you really understand this live below your means, and, and, and this is a lifelong, because your income is gonna change, and this may be very difficult at first, but if that net income is 10, I'm talking about structuring your personal economy as if it was eight okay mm -hmm. now we're now we're tumbling all those numbers down that you so beautifully described the student loan the 2000 and then the taxes and you know the 6100 now we're, we're going down to 4100 okay that's brutal okay mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is these are this is a mindset that you're gonna have to kind of to plow through here and and turn the corner and make this thing work um, so that was my first point is living below your means. And that was the example that I gave and maybe 2000, maybe 20% is too aggressive. Maybe 10% might be better in an initial phase. But I can tell you that when I understood this in 1980 something, I went back and it was 30% for me. Okay. And, and that, and my next point there, and you've heard this and this can't be reiterated enough, pay yourself first. And that's that whole point of taking things off the top. But because I guarantee you, whether you make $10,000 a month or a million dollars a month, if you have the mindset that, hey, if I ever have anything left over, that's what I'm going to save, it is never there, ever. It's always absorbed in something, okay? And so what I'm talking about are, are, are just really rock solid, you know, financial literacy things. Live below your means, pay yourself first. So if it's if we're peeling off one thousand or two thousand off of that monthly ten, that's off the top and that goes somewhere. Okay, you never see it. Okay, it's almost like a oh, it's almost like a withholding. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you build your personal lifestyle and economy around the remaining. Okay, and that's the only way you can painlessly do it. You can't. You, you absolutely can't do it the opposite. Okay, and then we had talked earlier in our previous podcast about debt prepayment, because debt prepayment is a really, it's an important discipline, okay? And we had mentioned, um, you know, there are some different strategies to do it, whether or not you take the highest interest rate. The one that I was taught was that you take the one that has the shortest term so that you have a feeling, you know, if you've got it alone that you can pay off in, in 18 months, at least do that so that you've accomplished something. It could, be, mm -hmm. it could be a higher interest rate. So there are some different theories, but the point is, the point is, is that debt needs to be approached you need to understand the danger of that and that it needs to be approached as something, you know, I need to get rid of this. It's not something that I'm always going to have debt, and it's always going to be hanging over me. 
it's something that you need to, you know, you need to consciously make a goal and say, I don't want to, I don't want debt. Okay. And I'm not necessarily talking about home mortgages, but I'm, you know, because the home mortgage is a different beast, but, but it's all the peripheral stuff that people want now. Okay. And, and it's a problem. So, um, and then the fourth step that I learned was to, um, invest conservatively for the long haul and the, and the, and the time, you know, the time power of money, you know, starting early, which is, uh, and, and you've seen the graphs and I'm sure you've talked about it and I'm, I'm sure you've shown people, but you know, the difference of doing something in your twenties between that and your forties is astronomical at the other end. Okay. So, so if you, if you somehow were able to focus on this, live below your means, have your personal economy just a tick lower than what you're making, take that money and go into debt prepayment and then invest. So my, my other note that I had here, which you, which you hit beautifully, is that there were two numbers that I learned over time and I have a longer term perspective. So in the mid, um, in the mid eighties, Greg Stanley, he would talk about what is real. And to him, 7% was real, you know, back then. And that was a conservative. You could actually get, tax-free municipal bonds like six or seven percent triple a rated mm -hmm. crazy you know that was but that was a that was a different place in time but i do remember in 2001 specifically when the market absolutely crashed and i always i always go and study warren buffett when it, when anything bad happens i just i want to see what he what he does and what he says and what he said was if in the next 20 years you can get six percent you're doing something so then i plugged that into my head and said you know, and that's my only, we had mentioned um, in the previous, like Dave Ramsey. And the only thing, the only problem I have with some, I'll, I'll listen to people and I'm all about, you know, like getting out of debt and this, that, and the other. But I really, really get uncomfortable when I see people in financial authority um, drawing out future returns for you, you know, in, in any plan. And they use 10, 12, 14. It makes it just it, it makes my skin crawl okay because that is not a realistic it's not in your best interest for someone to sit down and say you know you're gonna make 12% for the next 30 years if you draw that out there you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot of frustration and a lot of heartbreak and disappointment it's much it's a much better discipline to say 6% okay if I can do better than six great but you know 6% is it's within the realm of possibility okay Mm -hmm. and another thing, to, another thing to, 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 to kind of add in on that um, is the, the difference that, so if, you, if you're investing in something, um, if you're putting money into, say, like a, a, a municipal uh, or a, a, to a, muni, uh, a muni, muni, uh, mutual fund, sorry, I, I couldn't think of the word there. Um, mutual funds are, if, you're, if you have any type of like 401k or IRA or something like that through your company and they have these funds that are basically... A bunch of uh, these people, these money managers, um, they make money by pooling stocks together in these giant funds that you then invest in. And by investing in that fund, you basically get ownership in these very small pieces of these other companies. And they'll 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 buy and sell. We'll do all the work for you. Um, and the way they make their money is they charge a fee for you being a part of that group. Right. Um, I was reading something the other day that any um, investment that you have a fee involved with, um, as far as from purchasing, the 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 amount that that affects your return wow. is dramatic. So That's incredible. So if you look at the 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 one that I re looked at was it was a seven percent return over say like a twenty year period. If you had a seven percent return over a twenty year period and you were paying a two percent fee or penalty or whatever they call it um, and you and you won't always know that that fee is the, or expense ratio um, or whatever if a uh, 2% to 7% you know head math says okay that means if I had a 7% return and I paid 2% I'd have a 5% return no actually what you would do is it would turn because of the way that the, the compounding of that fee would increase with the downs and the ups right is that that would actually end up taking away of your 7% returns it would end up taking away something like sixty-eight percent of wow. your gains. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that. Yeah. So you only were, if you were to have been able to get that down to like a 02 percent expense, you'd have gotten to keep like eighty percent to ninety percent of your gains, which over a twenty-year period could mean literally seven figures. 
and yeah. just that and just that one thing. And right. then no statistical study I found that has said that any mutual fund has ever beaten just the market, just the stock market, correct? the general average market. So right. the beauty behind that is that there are funds out there that will allow you to invest in the stock market through a mutual fund. So Vanguard is a famous one. They have something right. like 0. 0.2 to 0.5% fees or something like that. Right. And you get in there and you just go with the market. So for example, you talked about, you know, getting these returns in, in 2001. In 2008, the stop, the, the Dow Jones got down to 6,443.27. I've got it up on another screen. 6,440. Right now we're in the 17 fives, something like that. Right. So I'd add another rule on that is that, you know, whenever the, whenever the economy is bad is whenever we have the least amount of money. I would say whenever the economy is bad is whenever you need to be putting as much money into the stock market indexes that are low fee bearing. Because right. if you had bought that in 2008, you would have almost triple your money at this point of whatever you were putting in back in 2008 up till now. You'd have right. had about, you'd have of astounding returns starting right. off at that point. And if you were investing, if you were to be doing that, if you were to have started and say, you know, 1995 and then done the same amount into that, just that fund every month, you would still be up a good amount from, from 1995 because of all of the gains, as long as you, you never freaked out and cashed out or anything like that. So, you know, it, that is another thing that is, that, that's a little bit more specific to financial right. literacy. Um, right. And, you know, people will have to go out there and do some, some research on that on their own. And actually the, the episode I had just before this was, was with the financial advisor. Um, but I'm sure he'd be, he'd be, he'd, he, he would say that everything I just said is correct. Um, so, it, but it's, it's, it's definitely something that, that needs to be heard. So go again, tell us again, I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. What were your four, your, your, your four things? To, uh, okay, just so the first one is to, is to live below your means. Okay. And, and establish your, your own personal economy based on living below your means. You pick the number, whether it's, you know, 10% or 20% or whatever. Mm -hmm. The second one is to pay yourself first. Okay. That money that comes off of you know, living below your means, that has to come off the top. It, it, it can't be money that you even see or touch. Um, the third is to is some sort of a pre-debt payment schedule. And, and like I said, I think, you know, that's something that that you can assist people in, in doing. There, there are a variety of different theories and, and techniques in doing it. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth is to uh, invest conservatively for the long haul, meaning as soon as possible. I mean, um, I, I mean, I've seen instances where I would even, if a person, like even in school, if you could make enough money for the IRA, I would take student loan money to, to fund an IRA if I could qualify for it. When mm -hmm. you see, when you see how, how, what that means on the, on the tail end. One other, one other comment I have about financial literacy that I've learned over time, and that has to do with human nature and greed. And, and Greg Stanley talked about this in the eighties. And once again, his, his mechanism at the time was municipal bonds. And he would talk about how people would go from, you know, let's say 7% was relatively safe. What would it take a person to go just completely bizarre out onto the farthest end of the junk bond, you know, risk scale? You know, you might think it would take like 15 or 20%. It didn't, it was took like 2%, you know, it would be like nine, okay? People, people take astronomical risk just to get a tick above. And I think I remember when I was watching that show about Bernie Madoff in his, in his Ponzi scheme, you know, his people were not making like giant astronomical, they were, they were making a tick above average, but it was consistent, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like crazy, you know, mm -hmm. so those people ended up taking astronomical amounts of risk. And, and that comes back to human nature where, you know, you and I, if, if, if I know that you're doing 7%, I want to do eight or nine, it's just a competitive, you know, it's just a natural, it's a natural human nature thing. You want to do better than someone else. So I think people is a part of financial literacy. You need to be conscious of your emotions. You need to be conscious of, of human nature. And, and, and like I said, when I, when Warren Buffett says 6%, I'm fine with 6%. I don't care if you're making 20. I don't care if you're making 30. I'm satisfied in my skin with the fact that over the long haul, if I hit that target, all I have to do is build my personal economy based on that number. And I have about a 90%, you know, certainty that I'm going to hit it. So 
you know, that's kind of getting into the, the psychology of investing, but we've kind of been all over the map today because financial literacy has a component of psychology, emotion. It has, you know, due diligence, accounting. All, it has, it's, it's a very sophisticated uh, topic, but I, but I, you know, I, I thank you for the opportunity today because I, I wanted to tell that story historically because when, when, a, when, when an industry is in a particular situation, and because I have a long-term perspective, I always want to know why. And if I was 25 years old, I would want to know why everything looks kind of, you know, corporate -y and why am I having to get a job? Why, when my, when my dad didn't have to do that or my mom didn't have to do that, why now? And so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to paint that picture. But the good news is I see so many things happening in a positive nature from the information standpoint and the empowerment standpoint and, and young people today. And, and that's what the message I want to get out. Take, take all of these resources and, and become empower yourself and know that you're responsible. Don't think because you're paying a tremendous amount of money for education. Uh, don't assume that this is, this is going to be, you know, you may get to graduation day and go, Hey, we never did touch on the uh, finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, just to, to, to kind of piggyback off of that, don't be afraid to, you know, the only way that, we, that the, the dentist can get out of this and not become an employee is to invest in yourself. And, yeah. you know, I used to hear people say invest in yourself. And I thought that meant from like a CPA standard, like I need to go get more CPE so that I can learn more about, you know, contractors license reviews and all the updates to the FASBs and, you know, inter, you know international tax issues and things like that. So I'll be smarter. Right. It wasn't, you know, at the end of the day, when I look back at what the most successful investing I did in myself was not that it was more investing in myself of being able to understand, you know, that like what you said is that, that I'm responsible for my actions. Correct. I'm the one that, that goes and do, does things. I'm the ones that makes things happen. I'm responsible. You know, I can make excuses and there's definitely external factors that, that do things. But at the end of the day, you know, we are all kind of the leaders of our own destiny. Right. Correct. So the investing in yourself is really realizing that, Hey, that this thing is doable. And it's a, to speaking to dentistry, being a dental practice owner is doable. Uh, it, it's one of the best industries in the world from a business perspective to be a part of, right? Uh, just because of the fact that you are running it as a business does not mean that you're a poor, uh, clinician, that you're a poor doctor. It just means that you're setting this practice up to be able to be there now as well as into the future for both yourself, your family, your staff, your staff's family, your patients, and your community. Because right. you do a disservice to all of those people involved if you run it unlike a business and it's not there in five years. Correct. So if you can get the if you invest in yourself and invest in, you know, being aware of things like the fact that you don't have to keep up with the Joneses. Right. Um, you know, internally understanding that because that is not that is something that everyone struggles with over it's time. It's, it's, uh, it's super hard. Yeah. As time goes on, you just become such a I don't think, you know, there, there's there's the old saying that, you know, a, a body in motion stays in motion. I think as like we we go as we go in motion through if we stay still, we feel we, we start feeling anxiety in our lives that we feel like we were doing something wrong. Yes. Uh, and today's financial environment is kind of built to keep you in one place because the cost of living is higher. The expenses that you have every day are higher. Um, the amount of money you make is not higher, typically, Correct. unless you do something outside of the norm, which is basically break through that ceiling. So circling back to what we talked about earlier about the $10,000 example, where you get down to $6,100, let's say that you're a, a, a small, if you're a, you're a dental practice owner and you're a practice doing, you know, $800,000 a year in revenue and you're doing 45% profitability on 240,000 or $800,000. Um, you're at, uh, with, uh, 45%, you're at $360,000 of income, the $800,000 a year practice, which is an average practice. Yeah, it's just average. Yeah. Um, you're making $360,000. That's 30,000 a month rather than 10,000 a month. 
the numbers right. we were talking about beforehand, they don't change. You still have got $3,900 right. in expenses, but you've now got $26,100 or from your example, $24,100 to spend every month. So you've still got the same outlay, but you've got so much more income. Right. A lot about, and when you talk, we talk about debt reduction. If you, if you, if anyone out there has ever heard of Dave Ramsey, he's a fantastic person to listen to. He talks about attacking debt. He talks about getting, you know, financial independence and all these other things. What a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of that is more about getting rid of your debt so that your income goes up. Correct. Because if your income goes up, you have more spending power, and as long as you have financial discipline and You've got the mentality part behind you. You've invested in yourself to understand, you know, who you are and how you can spend money, and that you don't have to do all these other things. Then your amount of income related to your expenses is going to be so much less, and you're going to have so much more income to be able to invest and then grow that quicker. Right. So, in dentistry, I believe that if you can make it as an owner yourself and you give yourself this income capacity increase, you're gonna be able to get past all of these issues we're talking about so much faster right. than as an employee. I mean, it's not even, there's, no, there's not even a comparison. If we were no. to be able to put a chart up to yeah. say like, this is someone who makes 360 a year, this is someone who makes 120 a year, and, and chart their, their wealth levels, it would yeah. be like the the 120 would 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 be bouncing up and down from the zero mark probably for most people, and the 360,000 one would be like a would just be a straight 45 degree angle up, right? Um, with because they're and they could even afford more expenses um, o over time, and they're in they could be honestly they could be a little bit um, you know. Uh, they could they could be they could spend a lot of money if they wanted to and they'd still do better than that hundred and twenty thousand just because of the difference in those two income levels. Yes, you have more taxes if you're doing three hundred thousand three sixty a year, but your income level is so much higher, it's not gonna matter comparatively to that hundred and twenty thousand dollar wage earner. And there's nothing against the people out there that are making one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. It's just a fact of the the numbers, it's a fact of the spending patterns, it's a fact of the industry that we're in. And it's basically, you know, the kind of the core component of what we're talking about today in financial literacy. Yeah. No, I think that's beautifully put. And and I think what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to have a young person have this employee position and then five years out just come to the realization that you, you know, every mm -hmm. year matters. You know what I'm saying? And so that's why as a dental student, third, fourth year, first year out, these whole concepts of long term implications of their decisions need to be made. I don't want somebody at five to 10 years going, you know what, I'm still making 120 at year 10. I've gotten nowhere. You know, I, I've gotten nowhere. And it's like, duh. And, and you will get nowhere at year 20. Okay, mm -hmm. you're going to be at the exact same place. And and we need to paint that picture. Because um, that's honestly, you know, that's the that's the whole thing on, you know, what I call every dentist is is uh, knows what informed consent is. I think there needs to be informed consent to dental students and just say, listen, okay, here's the picture. You know, this is the, and I need to paint the picture the first day as what it's going to be your first year out of school. Um, I think it's only fair. And, and that's what you're doing there is to say, there's a drastic difference between being an employee and being an entrepreneur. And, and so you're dedicated to the entrepreneur. I'm dedicated. Jamie's dedicated. Lots and lots of people right now are dedicated to supporting the, the entrepreneur effort. So, um, I, I just appreciate you giving me time to chat. Hey, absolutely. So to, 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 to take us out for the day, um, if you could have one sub or let's say, let's say a, two subjects that someone that's listening today that would like to be a little bit more financial literate, what are some subjects that they, cause when you think about financial literacy, there's so many aspects we could tackle. What would you say would be the two set? And I'll give two as well. What are two subjects you think someone should go out and educate themselves on um, that, that might be listening right now that wants to kind of up their game and their financial literacy? Okay. The, the first one, and this, this one may kind of surprise you, but this applies, this applies even to an employee. <clears throat> I think every dental student needs to know the, the, the average uh, overhead percentage in a dental office just by rote memory, okay, what it should look like. You just you that that's just 
I think that's a really, really important sounding uh, starting point um, that will serve them immensely well because I just see people not knowing what that, they rely on you for that number. How, how's my how's my rent in proportion to the whatever? Is my lab fee too high? You know, it's only six or eight metrics, okay? Mm -hmm. They need to know what that number is, okay? And, I, and I, even as an employee, I would want to know because I want to know how well run this office that I that I'm in or whether people being transparent and being honest if I have access to financials that number I want to know okay so that's from a business standpoint senior dental student memorize okay know what those metrics are um, personally I think even like uh, you know I've listened to Dave Ramsey a lot you know like I said there are things I like and things I don't like but philosophically to understand the, the psychology of, of controlling yourself and, and self-discipline, you know, and that might be that might be somewhere to start on the personal end of how you're uh, what I call my personal economy. This is my economy at home. So those are those are two things just top of mind that I think of. Okay, so understanding the overhead, the typical overhead in dental practices, as well as uh, understanding self-discipline and, and spending, uh, uh, which you could look at someone like Dave Ramsey to be able to do. Uh, to look to look at. So the two that I would say is that um, that I see a lot of dental dental students and, and young dentists not really understanding is um, just that the number one the leadership aspect in business of running a business uh, is, is so imperative. Uh, and you, I have a lot of people ask me like, how do you become a better leader? And it kind of yeah. circles back to what we talked about earlier is it's, it's really just understanding yourself. And yeah. once you understand yourself, you'll be able to understand other people a little bit, a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and so I would say start with some, some leadership uh, books out there. Um, there's I don't know, probably 30 million of them out there. Uh, and yeah. then, then there's, there's probably none that are wrong. It just really depends on, on what resonates with you the most. But um, definitely look into some do some investing in yourself of leadership. I think that's something that not people, many people think of. I think I shared with some people at that ideal practice at the startup practice blueprint that um, I don't think I know of a single dental practice owner that's a bad leader or that's a good leader that ha that does not have a successful practice. So you know, if I if I if I'm on the phone with one of my clients and I can tell that they're a lead, you can just tell when someone's a good leader. Um, right. They all have good practices. Uh, they all have, you know, top tier practices, like top 10% practices. Um, right. Whenever we talk about practices that are doing poorly, it's either they have just a really bad set of circumstances around them, like they're in a, this, they, they've, they, they got, they got a, they purchased the wrong practice or they were in the wrong, they're in the wrong area or something like that. Um, it's either that or they've got a team that they can't get to do anything correctly. So, Start investing in leadership. Start understanding leadership. Look into some some of the famous leaders in, in, our, in our society. Look at you know historical like um, like look at you know Eisenhower. Look at um, you know Abraham Lincoln. Look at people that have been in, in incredible leaders throughout history, and just kind of look at how they led people. Not how not you know you may not have to read some book about how to become a leader. I think looking at those people and how they did things is a way for you to be able to be able to approach those subjects. So the number one would be leadership. Um, the second one um, to, to not try and copy yours, because I think yours are both really, really good, um, is just understanding um, budgeting, personal budgeting to be able to uh, understand, you know, the importance and getting the discipline of actually doing it yourself, because budgeting in and of itself is not overtly complex the consistency of doing it over time is what's complex right being able to have the discipline to continue doing it over time um, and if you set those two skills up you're going to be able to have a really good head start on all the things that are going to hit you whenever you do become a practice owner right and i think the, other, the only other component to that too is if if you're married or in a relationship uh, it requires both people but that, that can't be a it can't be one person rowing the boat. It, it uh, you know, because it is tricky and it is complex. And and I think I've seen that in the people that that like even call in to Dame Ramsey. It's mm -hmm. both, when both people are in alignment is when that thing can be done. Because one person can't overcome another person with with no discipline. That's it's, it's stressful. And and not to get off topic again because I know we're closing up. But what's the number one cause of relationships to go bad? It's money. Money. Mm -hmm. 
So and what's a, what a better reason to have financial literacy? Yeah, the, the way that my wife and I did it is we took all of our monthly expenses that were coming out. So our mortgage and you know, child care payments, car payments, uh, at, you know, things like that. And we took all of those. We put that as, 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 a, as a number. We took then what uh, what we wanted to spend in a month. We subtracted our monthly numbers. We knew weren't going to change versus what we had as our goal for the month. And that difference we split into weeks and so every week on sunday night after the kids went to bed we sit down and we would say we'd look at both of how much money we'd spent that week and said are we underneath or above what we set for this week so let's say it was we wanted to spend 500 dollars a week outside of our monthly expenses right. um so we every week we'd sit down and i would, I would calculate out okay you know these were the expenses that were not monthly because what we do is we have all of our, you know, all mo most of our monthly expenses are ran through our bank account. All of our other stuff is put on our credit card. So I'd be able, able to segment my credit card versus our bank account. Um, and then I just pay the credit card off at the end of the week. But we then go through and say, okay, did we hit our goal or do we not hit our goal? Okay, we were over by, say, $100 this week. So that means that next week we need to be at $400. Right. And we just carry that over. And every time we did better, we'd put that into a side account that would be set aside for, you know, some type of like a, a vacation or something like that. Right. Um, and then the, the rest of the money would go into some type of a retirement or investment or something like that. So awesome. everybody has a different way of doing it, but my wife is not a financially literate person. Uh, and when I would try and approach her, I'd be coming from this, you know, pretty financial literate person to a no financial literacy. And like literally if I start talking numbers to her, she starts like just rolling her eyes and throwing her hands up. So for her, I had, we had to simplify it to say, okay, we're going to do something every week to discuss it. And we're going to, these are our goals that we're going to try and hit. Um, and it, that worked, that works for us. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a commitment because like I said, that's once yeah. a week. There's a lot of things we'd rather be doing on Sunday nights rather than rather than uh, talking about uh, you know budgets and things like that, but we we set aside time and it works. So anyway, so is there anything else uh, uh, you, you want wanted to cover before? No, I think before that's, go? that's pretty much everything I want to cover. I mean, I think I think there's an awesome amount of information that we that we packed into that hour. Uh, I, yeah, for sure. Very good. All right. Well, thank you again for your time. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to Dr. Larkin, uh, what, what was a good way for them to be able to reach out to you? My email is uh, tom at tomlarkin.com. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for coming on today and everybody out there. Have a good one. Special thanks to Dr. Larkin for joining us for a second time to share even more valuable insight. As you heard, the amount of money you make isn't as important as the ideals that you use to manage it. So to help you implement these principles right away, I've created a special bonus for you. It's called Four Rock Solid Financial Literacy Tips. To get that bonus, simply text PRACTICE to 33444. Again, that's PRACTICE to 33444. Or visit startyourdentalpractice.com slash bonus if you're outside of the U.S. you also receive updates on the latest episodes of Start Your Dental Practice, helpful tips for owning and running a practice, and promotional opportunities direct to your inbox. So that's it for today's episode. But that doesn't mean that the learning and implementation have to stop there. I've created a free report called the 15 numbers that will make or break your dental practice. This report has been downloaded over a thousand times by dental professionals. So if you want your free copy of this report, that's going to outline what the most important numbers are in any dental practice. And it also includes how to look at your numbers, how to set goals, has a whole slew of really important information that is the culmination of all of my experience as a dental, dental CPA. Then just go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. That is startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. And so that's it for today, Ambitious Dentist. Again, I'm Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV. See you next week with another world-class practice owner or consultant that will help you start your very own dental practice. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Start Your Dental Practice community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do me a favor and go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash iTunes to leave your honest feedback and review on iTunes. It's going to help me create a better experience a better show, a better podcast for you, the ambitious dentist. Your feedback really does help. 
regardless if you like the show today or not. If you didn't like the show, let me know because it's going to help me create a better show and podcast for you. Lastly, if you know of anybody that would benefit from today's episode and today's content, today's guest, please feel free to share with them on social media or through email. 